Hi there, in this video I'm going to be demonstrating Emacs's org mode, specifically how to use it with org babble to create technical documents like essays, blog posts, and how-to guides. When writing about programming or other technical subjects, you're often weaving blocks of source code, program output, and raw data in with your prose. These supplementary materials are usually copied and pasted into your document from other sources, which can be difficult and tedious to keep up to date as things change. Inconsistencies and errors can easily creep in when you hard code dynamic information like program output into your writing. In this example, we're going to be writing a blog post on how to manually create Git objects using Git plumbing commands on Python. I chose this example because there's lots of dynamic content like strings and SHA-1 hashes to contend with. I'm using GNU Emacs 26.3 in a terminal frame inside of Tmux. I also use GUI frames, which can look pretty great in org with the same underlying server process, which I'll show towards the end of the video. If you don't know what org mode is, you can think of it as an enhanced markdown language. It's a plain text formatting syntax that is designed to be converted to a much fancier format, like HTML or PDF. You've probably used a markdown language, maybe without even knowing it, when creating readme files for GitHub or GitLab, or composed a message on an online discussion forum like Reddit. When we say org mode, we mean that Emacs is in a mode where it knows you're editing a file in the org markdown language. This mode assists you by automatically rendering it in your buffer, as well as giving you some key commands to easily manipulate the structure of your document. If you look at your org mode file outside of Emacs, you can see what the plain text unrendered format looks like. I mentioned earlier that Markdown is designed to be converted to other formats. Let's see what it looks like when you export org to HTML. Ooh, 1994 called, they want their website back. Not to worry though, you can add some of that good old web 2.0 stuff like CSS fonts and JavaScript. I've set up this stuff in a file that will tell org to load and parse when exporting our document. The setup file directive can reference a URL or a file. This file has a bunch of HTML head directives that tell the HTML exporter to include local copies of JavaScript packages like jQuery and Twitter Bootstrap, as well as some CSS that implements this really cool Read the Docs inspired org theme called Read the Org by Fabrice Neeson. Now that we've configured the setup file, let's regenerate the HTML. Oh uh, yeah, that looks a lot better. Now that that is sorted out, let's get back to our essay. In this section of the Git essay we're writing, we want to demonstrate how you can manually do the work of Git init by creating the .git directory and the stuff that needs to go inside it. Org has this thing called org babble that lets you run blocks of code inside of your document. You create these blocks with the begin source directive. In this demo, we're going to be using both shell and Python blocks. Now, when it comes to shell blocks, it's a good idea to know some details about the environment that the shell code runs in. Things like your current working directory are sort of important. I created a shell source block with a couple of commands in it, and I told org to execute it. Org then wrote the output of those commands into my buffer below the source block. By default, your current working directory is going to be the same directory that the org file you're editing is in. You can also see that when we exported our git.org file to HTML, org wrote git.html to the same directory. This directory is not going to work for us. We want our code blocks to execute in a temporary directory that gets cleaned out every time we export the document. We can add these things called header args to our source blocks to tell org details about how we want these blocks executed. Here we use the dir header arg to point us at a scratch directory. Now when we execute this block, it sets our directory to home org temp. We don't want to have to remember to set this header arg on every source block though, so we'll create a global property that applies to every source block in this buffer. 
Now when we reevaluate this block, we're in the right directory, even though we didn't explicitly set it as a header arg on the block. Remember when I said that we wanted to clean out the directory every time we export this document? Let's do that now. We're going to tell org to include a file called code.inc, where we'll stash some utility functions that we'll use later in this document. This tag tells Emacs to load org mode when it opens this file, even though it doesn't end in .org. The name directive above the begin source block allows you to give the code block a name, which will be necessary to refer to it later. And this exports none header arg tells org that we don't want to see this code block or its results show up in the export of our document, but we do want it to execute. Because our Git tutorial depends on starting without a .git directory, then creating one and then adding an object to it, we'll need to blow away the junk that previous exports of our documents write to the temp directory. This way we start fresh. This call directive at the top of the file tells org to invoke the function that we just created to do that. All right, back to our Git tutorial. We're going to run git status to show that in the current state of the world, git is not happy because it doesn't have a .git dir. When we run git status here, notice how we redirect standard error to standard out. This is because org babble doesn't really capture standard error. And if you want to demonstrate what an error message looks like, this is what you have to do. This is the part of the essay where we show how to initialize a git repo by hand. I watched a YouTube video of this great talk that Tim Berglund gave back in 2013 called Git From The Bits Up. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend watching it. My fake essay here shamelessly rips off his awesome talk. Now we create another shell source block where we create a bunch of directories, add the head ref, run tree to show the tree, and then run git status to prove that git is happy. Both the tree command and the git status command add output to the result blocks. If you were to try this for yourself, you might be surprised to discover that in your version of Emacs, only the very last line of the shell block is outputted. This is because by default, org is in value mode, where the return value of the block you're executing is the result. In my Emacs config, I changed this default to scripting mode, where the results are anything written to standard out. Let's get rid of some old browser tabs and then export again to HTML to see what we're working with. Let me just add a quick note about what Git needs to be happy, and now we're going to move on to the next section of the document. This is where we show how you can hash an arbitrary string and store it in the Git object database. Now my first impulse is that that string should be hello world. And then I thought, eh, maybe it should be something like welcome to Siegel 2019, which is the conference I'm giving this talk at. And then I thought, you know, it should be dynamic so I can change it to whatever I want. So let's do that. Now we're back in the code.inc file where we're going to keep all the little utility functions that we use throughout the document. We're going to name this function hello, and its job is to just output whatever string we're using for our hash example. To mix things up a bit, we're going to do this example in Python. Under the hood, there's a Python 3 virtual environment that the script is running in, and that end equals quote quote at the end of the print line is just to tell print not to output a trailing new line. Let's save it, flip back to our document, and then replace the hard-coded text hello world with an inline call to the hello function. Did it work? Let's export it to HTML and see what it looks like. By default, org renders the output of inline functions in monospace, which I don't think looks very good here. We can fix it by adding a header tag to our function invocation. There we go, much better. Now we're going to create a new source block and we're going to name it hash object. This allows us to refer to the results of this block by name, which we're going to do later. Instead of echoing the literal hello world string, I have what looks like a function invocation surrounded by a pair of double angle brackets. This is what's called the noweb method. And when we execute it, the results are now tagged by name. 
here I paste in some verbiage about the git sha. And at this point, I want to mention that you don't always have to refer to the entire 40 character hash, and that you can often use as few as four characters to uniquely identify it. Here I'm at a dilemma. I want to hard code 05d5 into my document, which are the first four characters of the hash in this example. But if I change the hello string, I change the hash, and then my document is wrong if I forget to update all the hash references. Another inline function to the rescue. We'll define a function named shorthash, and this time we'll add the var tag to specify that this function takes a variable named line as an argument, and we'll provide a default because that's useful for testing. If we hit control C, control C to execute this block in the buffer, we can see that it uses the default, and it does indeed just output the first four characters of the line variable. Now we can just call this function in line and pass in the argument line equals hash object, which is the result of the named shell block we created above. Now we export it to HTML and take a look and see what it looks like. You'll notice that in this case, having the result of the inline function show up in monospace is actually what we want. Alright, now we're going to take a look and see where git actually stashes the object on the file system, and we'll create another shell block that does a tree to illustrate where that is. At this point, we're going to macro in some more verbiage. Okay, now we're going to create another shell block, which we're calling my hello, which is calling git cat file with dash p for pretty print on the short hash, and it's going to dump the object we stored in the database. Let's export to HTML and see what this looks like. Cool, looking good. Okay, for this next task, we're going to need to create a new function, a utility function called hash to dir. It's going to take as its argument a 40 character hash, and it's going to output the relative path of where that hash is stored in the git object database. So what we've done here is, once again, we've got a Python function with a variable called line, and we've set a default to some hash so we can easily test this. What the script does, this is a Python 3f string that basically prints, you know, dot git slash object slash, and then the first two characters of the hash, followed by a slash, followed by the remaining characters. The R strip at the end just gets rid of any extra white space that may exist in the input. And once again, if we hit control C, control C to execute it, we can see that it does what we expect. So here we are creating yet another shell block. This time we're calling cat with the relative path of the object on the file system, and we're piping it into the file utility. And we're also doing the same thing and piping it into gunzip. It's funny that the BSD file utility thinks this is a vax executable, but here we are. Okay, here's another shell block that is calling hash to dir, uh, piping it into pigz d to decompress it, piping that into hex dump. So this will be useful in showing the format of a blob on disk when it's uncompressed. We haven't exported to HTML in a while, so let's do that. And you can kind of see that now with all this code in here, it's taking longer to export. Looks good though. Okay, here's some more verbiage that explains how the header works. 
and I don't know if you can tell, but I made a mistake. I, I hard-coded the number of 22, which is the length of the string Welcome to Seagull 2019. Hopefully this should be the last time we have to go back to code.ink to create another little helper snippet or script. So this one is called Sterlen, and it just prints the length of the line. And now we replace this hard-coded 22 with an inline called a Sterlen, and we should get the very same result in our output. And we do. Sweet. I mentioned at the start of the video that I'd also show the GUI version of Emacs, so let me flip to it real quick. And as you can see, they look pretty similar, except with one notable difference. Pretty snazzy. I spend a lot of time in the terminal, though, and that's where I'm most comfortable, so I'm going to go back there. Okay, now comes the fun part. We're going to write some code in Python that attempts to do what git hash object does. So in the first part here, we're going to come up with the same SHA-1 hash that git did for this blob object, but we're going to do it in Python. We're typing this into an org mode buffer, and it's not doing us any favors in terms of our Python coding. So we're going to hit Control c single quote to jump into a Python mode. And now that we're in a Python mode, you know, we can type in some garbage and we see some error messages. Cool. We're going to type in some more code here. And you can see, you know, it's going to complete some function names for us, and that's cool. That's company mode in action. I don't know why anybody would select this like that, but that's what I did. Cool. So, you know, Python environment. This is LPy. And you can just hit Control C single quote to get back. And then we just hit Control C twice and Bob's your uncle. In this next section of the document, we're going to delete the old object that was previously written with git hash object to the file system. This code has some header args that we haven't used before. The exports code arg tells org to only export the code to the document. And the results silent arg tells org not to write any results to our buffer if we hit control C, control C to execute this block. Look, mom, no results. Okay, so now we're on the final stretch of the document. This is the last Python script that calculates the hash and writes it to disk, which it just did. Now we verify that git cat file can read the file that we just wrote. And spoiler alert, it can. So that brings us to the end of the document. Just writing some final thoughts here. Now this is the end of the document, but not the end of the video. I'm going to demonstrate how I publish some org documents next. So we haven't exported here in a tick, but I'm going to get to that. Let's take a look at my Emacs initialization file here. And I am not a great Emacs Lisp programmer. I know just about enough Emacs Lisp to configure Emacs, and that's about it. All right, now that that caveat is out of the way, let me talk about this function, mypublish. So the first thing it does is it turns on the table of contents. And we want a table of contents when we export to HTML because that's that cool sidebar on the left with the table of contents. That works well in HTML. And then that function org HTML publish to HTML actually publishes to HTML. The next thing we do is we turn off the table of contents because after that, we're publishing to ASCII and we're publishing to GFM. GFM stands for GitHub Flavored Markdown. And in both those formats, the table of contents just looks like crap. So that's why we're turning it off. So in a nutshell, turn table of contents on, publish HTML. Turn table of contents off, publish ASCII and publish GFM. Okay, so this section here, this org publish project A-list section, this is where you define your projects, 
and I've defined a project called git. I set its base directory, which is the directory that this org file that we've been working on is in. I defined a publishing directory, which for me is like git slash public in my home directory. We define a publishing function, which I just showed you, and we define a completion function. And this is a list of functions that get called when publishing is done. So let's check these functions out. Um, this function, my Firefox, basically just calls exec. It execs Firefox, and it sets the the URL for it to use as a file URL that points to my publishing directory. And then this my git publish function, this just executes a shell script that lives inside my publish directory. This shell script is just dumb simple. All it does is commit the changes, it uses the date in the commit message, and then it pushes to GitHub and GitLab. That's it. Now I'll show you what the publish workflow looks like. So let's flip back to the document and hit the publish command. And we select our project to publish. And this is gonna take a little bit because it's running all the code blocks multiple times. It's running it once when it HTML publishes, once when it publishes to ASCII, and once when it publishes to GitHub flavored markdown. So let's see what time it is now. It is 9.57. These files were pushed to GitLab at 9.57. All right. So let's take a look at the text file. Pretty cool. I like how it puts little ASCII boxes around the code and the results. That's pretty neat. And let's take a look at some of the GitHub flavored markdown. And I gotta say, this looks pretty good. I often publish to GFM at work as an intermediary step before finally exporting to Confluence. Editing in Emacs is so much nicer than using the Confluence Editor. Punching yourself in the face is nicer than using the Confluence Editor, but I digress. Anyway, we are at the end of this video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you learned something. If you want links to my dot files or source materials or any of that stuff, you can find it all in the video's description. Catch you next time.